So the other day, I heard about the following question from a friend. Is it possible in the Cartesian plane to draw a regular octagon with all of its coordinates being integers? I was like, huh, I don't know. Is it possible? Today's video is about exploring an answer to this question, and surprisingly, finding out how it connects to a classical result in a field known as crystallography, or the study of crystals. So without much more ado, let's get started. To begin, here's a picture of all the points of the Cartesian plane with integer coordinates, and you can see that they kind of form a square grid in the plane. So our question is, Within the square grid, can we draw a regular octagon with all its vertices as points in the grid? If you're curious, try it out. Try to draw a regular octagon using these vertices and see if you can do it. Now, if you've tried for a bit, you might find that it was a bit harder than you expected. And you might begin to suspect that, well, maybe there isn't a regular octagon in such a square grid. Like rats. It seems that octagons are like squares just with the corners cut off, right? But we can't really cut off the corners at just the right places. You know, maybe there isn't. Well, here's a property that might help. So, say you have a vector that exists in the grid. That is, if we started at some point in the grid, its endpoint will also be in the grid. So, for example, the vector that goes three units to the right and two units up, when we start it at the point one, one, then its endpoint will be at the point four, three both its start and end points are in the grid. Well, we can translate this vector to start at any other point in the grid, let's say one negative one, and its end point will still be a point in the grid. And this is true no matter where we translate it. So we can translate to the point, start at the point six zero, translate to the start at the point negative three two, and its end point will always be a point in the grid. And well, this should be pretty intuitive since if we move three units to the right and two units up from any point in the grid, you'll get another point in the grid. So how does this help us? I think the following proof is super cool. So suppose there was a regular octagon in the grid. What we can do is instead of considering its sides as sides, we can consider them as vectors. Starting from each vertex and going to the next vertex counterclockwise. Now what we can do is translate these vectors so that they all start at the origin, like so. Now, since we're in a square grid, and we've noted that we can shift vectors within the square grid, the endpoints of these vectors have to also be within the grid. And in particular, they have to form a new octagon. Let's call it the side length of the original octagon S and the side length of the new octagon L. Now what I claim is that L has to be strictly less than S, and some of you may know where this is going from here. For an explanation why, consider the isosceles triangle formed by two of these mid diagonals and L. Now each diagonal is side length S, and the interior angle they form is one eighth of the entire circle around the origin, or 45 degrees. Now, since the triangle formed by sides S, S, and L is an isosceles, and it has interior angle of less than 60 degrees, then its third side, namely L, has to be shorter than the sides of length S. L has to be less than S. And this shows that, well, the new octagon is smaller than the original octagon. With the power of animation, I can also show this visually, like that. But now with this new octagon, we can do the same thing we just did. We can call all its sides vectors, and then move them all to start at the origin. To make an even smaller octagon inside this small octagon. And we can just do this infinitely to get infinitely smaller octagons. But, but this is impossible, since remember our octagons have to have their vertices within a square grid. And the vertices in the square grid have a minimum distance between each other. You can't just have octagons spiraling infinitely down, ever smaller, because eventually the entire octagon will be smaller than the distance between two individual grid points, at which point we can confidently say that this octagon cannot be in the grid. So we've reached the contradiction from our original assumption that there was an octagon in the grid, and so therefore 
there can't be. So there we have it, a solution to our octagon puzzle. To summarize, we assumed that there was an octagon in the square grid, and then we derived a contradiction by showing that there always had to be a smaller octagon, no matter how small of an octagon we drew. So, how does this fun little puzzle connect to crystals? Well, the first thing we can do is generalize a bit. You may have noticed in the proof that we didn't really use any exact properties of the octagon. We just said an octagon because octagons are cool. But now let's take any n-gon for n greater than 6 and see what happens. We can do the same thing now as we did before and draw vectors corresponding to each of the sides of the n-gon. We can shift them all to the center, which will give us a new n-gon. And just like before, this new n-gon has to be smaller than the original polygon, since we can consider the isosceles triangle formed by two of the adjacent vectors in the side L, and considering its interior angle, which is 360 divided by n, we can see that this interior angle is less than 60 degrees. So since the interior angle of the isosceles triangle is less than 60, then the third side, which is L, has to be less than S. And so we can do the infinite descent thing again, where we can draw infinitely smaller n-gons and reach a contradiction. So there can't be any n-gons in a square grid for n greater than 6. We can also do a cheeky little thing with the pentagon. Since for pentagons, we can draw the vectors and then arrange them tip to tail to form a new pentagon this way. And again, this pentagon is smaller, as you can see. So therefore, we can do infinite descent and show that there's no pentagons in the square grid either. I'm going to take a moment here now to introduce a definition which will generalize the concept of a square grid. So given two basis vectors i and j, we're going to say that a lattice is going to be the set of all integer combinations ai plus bj of the two basis vectors. For example, this black point is going to be 2i plus 2j, since we go two units horizontally and then two units up. It's kind of like a square grid, but you tilt the axes a little, so it's not quite square anymore. Like here, all we did was take a square grid and then tilt the vertical axis a bit to the right, and all the points have to tilt correspondingly. So you can think of a lattice as kind of a square grid but tilted. The same thing works in three dimensions. This lattice here is a picture of all the integer combinations of the basis vectors i, j, and k, and in this case it's a cubic lattice. This definition is important because it turns out that the molecules of every crystal have to form a lattice, a three-dimensional lattice. It's what makes a crystal a crystal. So using this, we can now state the crystallographic restriction theorem, which says that a three-dimensional lattice or crystal can only have one, two, three, four, or six-fold rotational symmetry. And up to this point, we have all the tools we need to prove this now. We just need to start connecting the dots. So remember the following property of the square grid that we kept using, that given a vector in the grid with both its endpoint and start point in the grid, we can shift its start point to any other point and it'll still end in the grid. Well, it turns out that the same property works for lattices in general, and maybe it's not too hard to see why, since all we did was take the square grid and then tilt one of its axes a bit. So consider this vector here, which is the vector 2, 2, starting from the point 2, 1. We can shift this endpoint to be any of these other points, and it'll still end in the lattice. But really, this property of shifting vectors is the only property of square grids that we actually used to show that there's no regular octagon in a square grid. And what this means is that we can do the same proof on any lattice. So consider this octagon in the lattice. We can again shift its vectors to the origin and get a smaller regular octagon 
And from there, we can derive a contradiction from infinite descent, just like we did before. And this works for all the things we did before. So for any n gon n greater than 6, there's no n gon in any lattice. And similarly, there's no regular pentagon in the lattice either. We can find equilateral triangles and regular hexagons in a lattice. Take the lattice with a central angle of 60 degrees between the two axes. And in this lattice, it's easy to find regular hexagons and equilateral triangles. Just take any three adjacent points to make a triangle, and take six of those triangles to make a hexagon. So, we can find equilateral triangles, hexagons, and we can find squares, obviously, in a square lattice. So, we can study it all together as a regular n-gon in a two-dimensional lattice must have three, four, or six sides. And maybe some of you are starting to catch on that it's quite similar now to our theorem, which says that a three-dimensional lattice can only have one, two, three, four, or six-fold rotational symmetry. Oh, we're getting there. The key to extend this all to three dimensions is to notice that three-dimensional lattices, they're still lattices. So given any vector in a three-dimensional lattice, we can shift its origin to any other point in the lattice, and it'll still end in the lattice. And what this means is that we can shift our entire proof over to three dimensions, and it'll still work. So a regular n-gon in a three-dimensional lattice must also have three, four, or six sides. That's kind of the magic of this proof. It just shifts over to three dimensions seamlessly. For the last piece of the puzzle, we need to connect our idea about regular n-gons to the idea of rotational symmetries. So to do that, let's look to the right here and consider any objects with some rotational symmetry about the point O. And let the back point be some point in the object. So for example, let's say the object has 8-fold rotational symmetry. What we're going to do is let this symmetry act on this black point about O. So after one rotation, the point will go there. So this new black point has to be within our object. After two rotations, it'll go there, and so on. With all these points having to be in our object, in order to ensure that the object has 8-ball rotational symmetry. But then notice, the object contains a regular octagon formed by these eight points. And what this means is that an n fold rotational symmetry exists means a regular n-gon exists in the object. And to take the converse of this statement, contrapositive, we can say that a regular n-gon does not exist implies that there's no n-fold rotational symmetry of the object. And now we've made it. Since we've established that a regular n-gon in a lattice can't have five or more than six sides, and that a regular n-gon does not exist implies that there's no n-fold rotational symmetry. So therefore, a three-dimensional lattice or crystal cannot have rotational symmetry which is not one, two, three, four, or six-fold. And for the other half of this theorem, our good old square lattice on the left has one, two, and four-fold rotational symmetry, and the hexagonal lattice on the right has three and six-fold rotational symmetry. And that, that's it. That completes the proof of the theorem, that a three-dimensional lattice, a crystal, can only have one, two, three, four, or six-fold rotational symmetry. If you've watched all the way to this point, thank you so much for joining me on this journey from our puzzle about the octagon all the way to the proof of this amazing theorem. I hope it was a fun ride and see you guys next time.